from the point of view of the criminal expert, said Mr. Sherlock Holmes, London has become a singularly uninteresting city since the death of the late lamented Professor Moriarty. I can hardly think that you would find many decent citizens to agree with you, I answered. Well, well, I must not be selfish, said he, with a smile, as he pushed back his chair from the breakfast table. The community is certainly the gainer, and no one the loser, save the poor out-of-work specialist whose occupation has gone. With that man in the field, one's morning paper presented infinite possibilities. Often it was only the smallest trace, Watson, the faintest indication, and yet it was enough to tell me that the great malignant brain was there, as the gentlest tremors of the edges of the web remind one of the foul spider which lurks in the centre. Petty thefts, wanton assaults, purposeless outrage. To the man who held the clue, all could be worked into one connected whole. To the scientific student of the higher criminal world, no capital in Europe offered the advantages which London then possessed. But now... He shrugged his shoulders, in humorous deprecation of the state of things which he had himself done so much to produce. At the time of which I speak, Holmes had been back for some months, and I, at his request, had sold my practice and returned to share the old quarters in Baker Street. A young doctor named Werner had purchased my small Kensington practice, and given with astonishingly little demur the highest price that I ventured to ask, an incident which only explained itself some years later, when I found that Werner was a distant relation of Holmes, and that it was my friend who had really found the money. Our months of partnership had not been so uneventful as he had stated, for I find, on looking over my notes, that this period includes the case of the papers of ex-President Murillo, and also the shocking affair of the Dutch steamship Friesland, which so nearly cost us both our lives. His cold and proud nature was always averse, however, from anything in the shape of public applause, and he bound me in the most stringent terms to say no further word of himself, his methods, or his successes, a prohibition which, as I have explained, has only now been removed. Mr. Sherlock Holmes was leaning back in his chair after his whimsical protest, and was unfolding his morning paper in a leisurely fashion, when our attention was arrested by a tremendous ring at the bell, followed immediately by a hollow drumming sound, as if someone were beating on the outer door with his fist. As it opened there came a tumultuous rush into the hall, rapid feet clattered up the stairs, and an instant later a wild-eyed and frantic young man, pale, dishevelled, and palpitating, burst into the room. He looked from one to the other of us, and under our gaze of inquiry he became conscious that some apology was needed for this unceremonious entry. "'I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes,' he cried. "'You mustn't blame me. "'I am nearly mad. "'Mr. Holmes, I am the unhappy John Hector Macfarlane.' He made the announcement as if the name alone would explain both his visit and its manner. But I could see by my companion's unresponsive face that it meant no more to him than to me. "'Have a cigarette, Mr. Macfarlane,' said he, pushing his case across. "'I am sure that with your symptoms my friend Dr. Watson here would prescribe a sedative. The weather has been so very warm these last few days.' "'Now,' If you feel a little more composed, I should be glad if you would sit down in that chair and tell us very slowly and quietly who you are and what it is that you want. You mentioned your name as if I should recognise it. But I assure you that beyond the obvious facts that you are a bachelor, a solicitor, a Freemason and an asthmatic, I know nothing whatever about you. Familiar as I was with my friend's methods, it was not difficult for me to follow his deductions, and to observe the untidiness of attire, the sheaf of legal papers, the watch charm, and the breathing which had prompted them. Our client, however, stared in amazement. 
Yes, I am all that, Mr. Holmes. And in addition, I am the most unfortunate man at this moment in London. For heaven's sake, don't abandon me, Mr. Holmes. If they come to arrest me before I've finished my story, make them give me time, so that I may tell you the whole truth. I could go to jail happy if I knew that you were working for me outside. Arrest you? said Holmes. This is really most gratif— most interesting. On what charge do you expect to be arrested? Upon the charge of murdering Mr. Jonas Oldacre of Lower Norwood. My companion's expressive face showed a sympathy which was not, I am afraid, entirely unmixed with satisfaction. Dear me, he said. It was only this moment at breakfast that I was saying to my friend Dr. Watson that sensational cases had disappeared out of our papers. Our visitor stretched forward a quivering hand and picked up the Daily Telegraph, which still lay upon Holmes's knee. If you had looked at it, sir, you would have seen at a glance what the errand is on which I have come to you this morning. I feel as if my name and my misfortune must be in every man's mouth. He turned it over to expose the central page. Here it is, and with your permission I will read it to you. Listen to this, Mr. Holmes. The headlines are Mysterious Affair at Lower Norwood Disappearance of a Well-Known Builder Suspicion of Murder and Arson Mr. Oldacre is a bachelor. Fifty-two years of age, and lives in Deep Dean House, at the Sydenham end of the road of that name. He has had the reputation of being a man of eccentric habits, secretive and retiring. For some years he has practically withdrawn from the business, in which he is said to have amassed considerable wealth. A small timber yard still exists, however, at the back of the house. And last night, about twelve o'clock, an alarm was given that one of the stacks was on fire. The engines were soon upon the spot, but the dry wood burned with great fury, and it was impossible to arrest the conflagration until the stack had been entirely consumed. Up to this point the incident bore the appearance of an ordinary accident, but fresh indications seemed to point to serious crime. Surprise was expressed at the absence of the master of the establishment from the scene of the fire, and an inquiry followed which showed that he had disappeared from the house. An examination of his room revealed that the bed had not been slept in, that a safe which stood in it was open, that a number of important papers were scattered about the room, and finally that there were signs of a murderous struggle slight traces of blood being found within the room, and an oaken walking-stick, which also showed stains of blood upon the handle. It is known that Mr. Jonas Oldacre had received a late visitor in his bedroom upon that night, and the stick found has been identified as the property of this person, who is a young London solicitor named John Hector Macfarlane, junior partner of Graham and Macfarlane of 426 Gresham Buildings, E.C. The police believe that they have evidence in their possession which supplies a very convincing motive for the crime. And altogether it cannot be doubted that sensational developments will follow. Later, it is rumoured as we go to press that Mr. John Hector Macfarlane has actually been arrested on the charge of the murder of Mr. Jonas Oldacre. It is at least certain that a warrant has been issued. There have been further and sinister developments in the investigation at Norwood. Besides the signs of a struggle in the room of the unfortunate builder, it is now known that the French windows of his bedroom, which is on the ground floor, were found to be open that there were marks as if some bulky object had been dragged across to the woodpile. And finally it is asserted that charred remains have been found among the charcoal ashes of the fire. Mr. John Hector Macfarlane, said Lestrade. Our unfortunate client rose with a ghastly face. I arrest you for the willful murder of Mr. Jonas Oldacre, of Lower Norwood. Mr. Macfarlane turned to us with a gesture of despair, 
and sank into his chair once more like one who is crushed. One moment, Lestrade, said Holmes. Half an hour, more or less, can make no difference to you. And the gentleman was about to give us an account of this very interesting affair, which might aid us in clearing it up. I think there will be no difficulty in clearing it up, said Lestrade grimly. Nonetheless, with your permission, I should be much interested to hear his account. Well, Mr. Holmes, it is difficult for me to refuse you anything, for you have been of use to the force once or twice in the past, and we owe you a good turn at Scotland Yard, said Lestrade. At the same time, I must remain with my prisoner, and I am bound to warn him that anything he may say will appear in evidence against him. I wish nothing better, said our client. All I ask is that you should hear and recognise the absolute truth. Lestrade looked at his watch. I'll give you half an hour, said he. I must explain first, said Macfarlane, that I knew nothing of Mr. Jonas Oldacre. His name was familiar to me, for many years ago my parents were acquainted with him, but they drifted apart. I was very much surprised, therefore, when yesterday, about three o'clock in the afternoon, he walked into my office in the city, but I was still more astonished when he told me the object of his visit. He had in his hand several sheets of a notebook covered with scribbled writing. Here they are, and he laid them on my table. Here is my will, said he. I want you, Mr. Macfarlane, to cast it into proper legal shape. I will sit here while you do so. I set myself to copy it, and you can imagine my astonishment when I found that, with some reservations, he had left all his property to me. You can imagine, Mr. Holmes, that I was not in a humour to refuse him anything that he might ask. He was my benefactor and all my desire was to carry out his wishes in every particular. I sent a telegram home, therefore, to say that I had important business on hand, and that it was impossible for me to say how late I might be. Mr. Oldacre had told me that he would like me to have supper with him at nine, as he might not be home before that hour. I had some difficulty in finding his house, however, and it was nearly half-past before I reached it. I found him one moment said Holmes. Who opened the door? A middle-aged woman, who was, I suppose, his housekeeper. And it was she, I presume, who mentioned your name. Exactly, said Macfarlane. Pray proceed. Macfarlane wiped his damp brow and then continued his narrative. I was shown by this woman into a sitting-room where a frugal supper was laid out. Afterwards, Mr. Jonas Oldacre led me into his bedroom, in which there stood a heavy safe. This he opened and took out a mass of documents, which we went over together. It was between eleven and twelve when we finished. He remarked that we must not disturb the housekeeper. He showed me out through his own French window, which had been open all this time. Was the blind down? asked Holmes. I will not be sure but I believe that it was only half down. Yes, I remember how he pulled it up in order to swing open the window. The official looked at them with a puzzled expression. I can read the first few lines, and these in the middle of the second page, and one or two at the end. These are as clear as print, said he. But the writing in between is very bad. And there are three places where I cannot read it at all. What do you make of that? said Holmes. Well, what do you make of it? That it was written in a train. The good writing represents stations, the bad writing movement, and the very bad writing passing over points. A scientific expert would pronounce at once that this was drawn up on a suburban line, since nowhere, save in the immediate vicinity of a great city, could there be so quick a succession of points. Granting that this whole journey was occupied in drawing up the will, then the train was an express, only stopping once between Norwood and London Bridge. Lestrade began to laugh. 
You are too many for me when you begin to get on your theories, Mr. Holmes, said he. How does this bear on the case? Well, it corroborates the young man's story, to the extent that the will was drawn up by Jonas Oldacre in his journey yesterday. It is curious, is it not, that a man should draw up so important a document in so haphazard a fashion. It suggests that he did not think it was going to be of much practical importance. If a man drew up a will which he did not intend ever to be effective, he might do it so. Well, he drew up his own death warrant at the same time, said Lestrade. Oh, you think so? Don't you? Well, it is quite possible, but the case is not clear to me yet. Not clear? Well, if that isn't clear, what could be clear? Here is a young man who learns suddenly that, if a certain older man dies, he will succeed to a fortune. What does he do? He says nothing to anyone, but he arranges that he shall go out on some pretext to see his client that night. He waits until the only other person in the house is in bed, and then, in the solitude of the man's room, he murders him burns his body in the woodpile, and departs to a neighbouring hotel. The future will show which is right. Just notice this point, Mr. Holmes, that so far as we know, none of the papers were removed, and that the prisoner is the one man in the world who had no reason for removing them, since he was the heir at law, and would come into them in any case. My friend seemed struck by this remark. I don't mean to deny that the evidence is in some ways very strongly in favour of your theory, said he. I only wish to point out that there are other theories possible. As you say, the future will decide. Good morning. I dare say that in the course of the day I shall drop in at Norwood and see how you are getting on. When the detective departed, my friend rose and made his preparations for the day's work with the alert air of a man who has a congenial task before him. My first movement, Watson, said he, as he bustled into his frock coat, must, as I said, be in the direction of Blackheath. And why not Norwood? Because we have in this case one singular incident coming close to the heels of another singular incident. The police are making the mistake of concentrating their attention upon the second because it happens to be the one which is actually criminal. But it is evident to me that the logical way to approach the case is to begin by trying to throw some light upon the first incident, the curious will so suddenly made, and to so unexpected an air. It may do something to simplify what followed. No, my dear fellow, I don't think you can help me. There is no prospect of danger or I should not dream of stirring out without you. I trust that when I see you in the evening, I will be able to report that I have been able to do something for this unfortunate youngster, who has thrown himself upon my protection. It was late when my friend returned, and I could see by a glance at his haggard and anxious face that the high hopes with which he had started had not been fulfilled. She rummaged in a bureau, and presently she produced a photograph of a woman, shamefully defaced and mutilated with a knife. That is my own photograph, she said. He sent it to me in that state, with his curse, upon my wedding morning. Well, said I, at least he has forgiven you now, since he has left all his property to your son. Neither my son nor I want anything from Jonas Oldacre, dead or alive, she cried with a proper spirit. There is a God in heaven, Mr. Holmes, and that same God who has punished that wicked man will show, in his own good time, that my son's hands are guiltless of his blood. Well, I tried one or two leads, but could get at nothing which would help our hypothesis, and several points which would make against it. I gave it up at last, and off I went to Norwood. This place, Deep Dean House, is a big modern villa of staring brick, standing back in its own grounds, with a laurel-clumped lawn in front of it. To the right, and some distance back from the road, 
was the timber yard, which had been the scene of the fire. Here's a rough plan on a leaf of my notebook. This window on the left is the one which opens into Old Acre's room. You can look into it from the road, you see. That is about the only bit of consolation I have had today. Lestrade was not there, but his head constable did the honours. They had just found a great treasure trove. They had spent the morning raking among the ashes of the burned woodpile, and beside the charred organic remains they had secured several discoloured metal discs. I examined them with care, and there was no doubt that they were trouser buttons. I even distinguished that one of them was marked with the name of Hyams, who was Old Acre's tailor. I then worked the lawn very carefully for signs and traces, but this drought has made everything as hard as iron. Nothing was to be seen, save that some body or bundle had been dragged through a low privet hedge, which is in a line with the woodpile. All that, of course, fits in with the official theory. I crawled about the lawn with an August sun on my back, but I got up at the end of an hour no wiser than before. And yet? And yet? He clenched his thin hands in a paroxysm of conviction. I know it's all wrong. I feel it in my bones. There is something that has not come out, and that housekeeper knows it. There was a sort of sulky defiance in her eyes which only goes with guilty knowledge. However, there's no good talking any more about it, Watson. But unless some lucky chance comes our way, I fear that the Norwood disappearance case will not figure in that chronicle of our successes, which I foresee that a patient public will sooner or later have to endure. Surely, said I, the man's appearance would go far with any jury. That is a dangerous argument, my dear Watson. You remember that terrible murderer, Bert Stevens, who wanted us to get him off in 87? Was there ever a more mild-mannered Sunday school young man? It is true. Unless we succeed in establishing an alternative theory, this man is lost. You can hardly find a flaw in the case which can now be presented against him. And all further investigation has served to strengthen it. By the way, there is one curious little point about those papers which may serve us as the starting point for an inquiry. On looking over the bank book, I found that the low state of the balance was principally due to large cheques which had been made out during the last year to Mr. Cornelius. I confess that I should be interested to know who this Mr. Cornelius may be, with whom a retired builder has such very large transactions. Is it possible that he has had a hand in the affair? Cornelius might be a broker but we have found no script to correspond with these large payments. Failing any other indication, my researches must now take the direction of an inquiry at the bank for the gentleman who has cashed these cheques. I have formed no conclusion whatever, my companion answered, but we formed ours yesterday, and now it proves to be correct, so you must acknowledge that we have been a little in front of you this time, Mr. Holmes. You certainly have the air of something unusual having occurred, said Holmes. Lestrade laughed loudly. You don't like being beaten any more than the rest of us do, said he. A man can't expect always to have it his own way, can he, Dr. Watson? Step this way, if you please, gentlemen, and I think I can convince you once for all that it was John McFarlane who did this crime. He led us through the passage and out into a dark hall beyond. This is where young Macfarlane must have come out to get his hat after the crime was done, said he. Now look at this. With dramatic suddenness he struck a match, and by its light exposed a stain of blood upon the whitewashed wall. As he held the match nearer, I saw that it was more than a stain. It was the well-marked print of a thumb. Look at that with your magnifying glass, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I am doing so. You are aware that no two thumb marks are alike? I have heard something of the kind. 
Well then, will you please compare that print with this wax impression of young Macfarlane's right thumb, taken by my orders this morning. As he held the waxen print close to the blood stain, it did not take a magnifying glass to see that the two were undoubtedly from the same thumb. Holmes was outwardly calm, but his whole body gave a wriggle of suppressed excitement as he spoke. By the way, Lestrade, who made this remarkable discovery? It was the housekeeper, Mrs. Lexington, who drew the night constable's attention to it. Where was the night constable? He remained on guard in the bedroom where the crime was committed, so as to see that nothing was touched. But why didn't the police see this mark yesterday? Well, we had no particular reason to make a careful examination at the hall. Besides, it's not in a very prominent place, as you see. No, no, of course not. I suppose there is no doubt that the mark was there yesterday? Lestrade looked at Holmes as if he thought he was going out of his mind. I confess that I was myself surprised both at his hilarious manner and at his rather wild observation. I don't know whether you think that Macfarlane came out of jail in the dead of night in order to strengthen the evidence against himself, said Lestrade. I leave it to any expert in the world whether that is not the mark of his thumb. It is unquestionably the mark of his thumb. There, that's enough, said Lestrade. I am a practical man, Mr Holmes, and when I've got my evidence I come to my conclusions. If you have anything to say, you will find me writing my report in the sitting room. Holmes had recovered his equanimity, though I still seemed to detect gleams of amusement in his expression. Dear me, this is a very sad development, Watson, is it not? said he. And yet there are singular points about it which hold out some hopes for our client. I'm delighted to hear it, said I heartily. I was afraid it was all up with him. I would hardly go so far as to say that, my dear Watson. The fact is that there is one really serious flaw in this evidence to which our friend attaches so much importance. Indeed, Holmes, what is it? Only this that I know that that mark was not there when I examined the hall yesterday. I will ask you to carry in two bundles of it. I think it will be of the greatest assistance in producing the witness whom I require. Thank you very much. I believe you have some matches in your pocket, Watson. Now, Mr. Lestrade, I will ask you all to accompany me to the top landing. As I have said, there was a broad corridor there which ran outside three empty bedrooms. At one end of the corridor we were all marshalled by Sherlock Holmes, the constables grinning and Lestrade staring at my friend with amazement, expectation and derision chasing each other across his features. Holmes stood before us with the air of a conjurer who is performing a trick. Would you kindly send one of your constables for two buckets of water? Put the straw on the floor here, free from the wall on either side. Now I think that we are all ready. Lestrade's face had begun to grow red and angry. I don't know whether you're playing a game with us, Mr Sherlock Holmes, said he. If you know anything, you can surely say it without all this tomfoolery. I assure you, my good Lestrade, that I have an excellent reason for everything that I do. You may possibly remember that you chaffed me a little some hours ago when the sun seemed on your side of the hedge. So you must not grudge me a little pomp and ceremony now. Might I ask you, Watson, to open that window and then to put a match to the edge of the straw? I did so, and driven by the draught, a coil of grey smoke swirled down the corridor, while the dry straw crackled and flamed. Mr. Holmes, he continued when they had gone, I could not speak before the constables, but I don't mind saying, in the presence of Dr. Watson, that this is the brightest thing that you have done yet. Though it is a mystery to me how you did it, you have saved an innocent man's life, and you have prevented a very grave scandal, which would have ruined my reputation in the force. 
Holmes smiled and clapped Lestrade upon the shoulder. Instead of being ruined, my good sir, you will find that your reputation has been enormously enhanced. Just make a few alterations in that report which you were writing, and they will understand how hard it is to throw dust in the eyes of Inspector Lestrade. And you don't want your name to appear? Not at all. The work is its own reward. Perhaps I shall get the credit also at some distant day, when I permit my zealous historian to lay out his fool's cap once more. Eh, Watson? Well, now, let us see where this rat has been lurking. A lath and plaster partition had been run across the passage six feet from the end, with a door cunningly concealed in it. It was lit within by slits under the eaves. A few articles of furniture and a supply of food and water were within, together with a number of books and papers. There's the advantage of being a builder, said Holmes as we came out. He was able to fix up his own little hiding place without any confederate, save, of course, that precious housekeeper of his, whom I should lose no time in adding to your bag, Lestrade. I'll take your advice. But how did you know of this place, Mr. Holmes? I made up my mind that the fellow was in hiding in the house. When I paced one corridor and found it six feet shorter than the corresponding one below, it was pretty clear where he was. I thought he had not the nerve to lie quiet before an alarm of fire. We could, of course, have gone in and taken him, but it amused me to make him reveal himself. Besides, I owed you a little mystification, Lestrade, for your chaff in the morning. Well, sir, you certainly got equal with me on that. During the last year or two, things have gone against him. Secret speculation, I think and he finds himself in a bad way. He determines to swindle his creditors, and for this purpose he pays large checks to a certain Mr. Cornelius, who is, I imagine, himself under another name. I have not traced these checks yet, but I have no doubt that they were banked under that name at some provincial town where Old Acre, from time to time, led a double existence. He intended to change his name altogether, draw this money and vanish, starting life again elsewhere. Well, that's likely enough. It would strike him that in disappearing he might throw all pursuit off his track and at the same time have an ample and crushing revenge upon his old sweetheart if he could give the impression that he had been murdered by her only child. But he had not that supreme gift of the artist, the knowledge of when to stop. He wished to improve that which was already perfect, to draw the rope tighter yet round the neck of his unfortunate victim. And so he ruined all. Let us descend, Lestrade. There are just one or two questions that I would ask him. The malignant creature was seated in his own parlour, with a policeman upon each side of him. It was a good joke, my good sir, a practical joke, nothing more, he whined incessantly, I assure you, sir. The little man started and turned his malignant eyes upon my friend. I have to thank you for a good deal, said he. Perhaps I'll pay my debt some day. Holmes smiled indulgently. I fancy that for some few years you will find your time very fully occupied, said he. By the way, what was it you put into the woodpile besides your old trousers? A dead dog, or rabbits, or what? You won't tell me. Dear me, how very unkind of you. Well, well, I dare say that a couple of rabbits would account both for the blood and for the charred ashes. If ever you write an account, Watson, you can make rabbits serve your turn. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.